Senator, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. This year's NC Works series focuses on the economy. And we know that this recession has touched each and every North Carolinian, whether they're young or old or rural or urban or an entrepreneur or an employee in a large corporation. It's touched everyone. So what we'd like to do with this time is talk about both the challenges and the opportunities that have arisen during this historic economic downturn. Um, and then we'd also like to talk about the shape that the recovery might take in the coming biennium. So to get us going in that direction with the hope of, of addressing some of those issues, I'll start with the broadest possible brush strokes. So the first question is, how would you describe the role of the legislature um, in shaping North Carolina's economic future? You know, I think the legislature, in terms of the policy that, uh, that the state uh, follows, uh, in connection with um, what, what is the role of government in the economy as as a whole, you know, a government has has certain defined functions. Uh, the, uh, the the idea uh, for government uh, to begin with is uh, to protect public safety, and uh, we also have uh, have a function uh, in uh, in education. We have a function in uh, uh, in terms of uh, transportation and infrastructure. We have a function in terms of uh, the overall safety net. Uh, but with reference to the uh, to the economy beyond those defined things, uh, government's function uh, really needs to be one of um, uh, of trying to create an environment uh, where the private sector can thrive, uh, where the, uh, the the individual entrepreneur, or the small business, or the uh, the private company uh, has an opportunity to grow, to profit, to uh, to to employ people, to uh, uh, innovate. Uh, and the best way, uh, I think, again in broad strokes, the best way for uh, government to do that uh, is to uh, leave as uh, light a footprint uh, as possible uh, in the uh, private economy. And uh, as light a footprint as possible in terms of taxation, uh, in terms of regulation, uh, in terms of uh, interference uh, in any way with, uh, uh, with the private economy. And uh, let uh, those uh, people and those private entities uh, that uh, that exist uh, sink or swim, uh, pretty much on their own merit uh, and based on uh, competition in the marketplace. Okay, thank you. So let's take a look down the road, if we can, sort of dust off our crystal ball at how the economy might look in the future. First of all, um, in in the establishing context, do you agree that North Carolina's economy has been in transition for some time? And then maybe we can talk, if if you agree that that's the case, about the fact that we're still heavily invested in agribusiness, it's still a critical component of our economy, but as the manufacturing sector has shrunk, the intellectual and service industries have grown. So as we look down the road um, at the, the economy, tell us what you think about the big picture. Do you see that um, that transition is going to be impacted in some way by current circumstances and, and what you propose to do for and with the economy. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone who uh, has uh, has taken a look at uh, North Carolina uh, over the course of uh, even as short a period of time as 15 or 20 years uh, can come away with a conclusion other than North Carolina is a state in transition. Uh, we're in a state of transition in terms of our population, and we, we are uh, a state that is uh, adding population, whereas uh, a number of states are, are shrinking. Uh, we're a state that is uh, in transition in terms of uh, how people work, uh, and we're in a state of transition uh, in terms of uh, just the makeup of our population, uh, age uh, particularly. We're, we're getting older. Uh, we, uh, uh, we are having more retirees, uh, either uh, people that have moved here or people uh, who, uh, who are retired a after having uh, uh, their, their work life uh, here in North Carolina. Uh, the, the change uh, is, uh, it, it really does go down to the types of things people do for a living as well, and, and that's uh, a reflection of uh, some of those broader changes. So uh, you mentioned manufacturing shrinking, and, uh, and uh, it, it has. Uh, and in some respects, it hasn't. If you look at manufacturing output, uh, we're still a state that has a significant uh, manufacturing base. But the big difference is that uh, we don't employ nearly as many people uh, as we used 
to employ in manufacturing. Uh, but as far as output is concerned, uh, it's still a significant part of our economy. Uh, agribusiness, you're absolutely right about that. Even with all the changes uh, in terms of uh, the tobacco economy, uh, agriculture is a huge part uh, of, uh, of our economy. And it's uh, more now uh, in, the, uh, in the form of uh, foodstuffs and, uh, and, and, and things that, uh, uh, that people consume uh, in terms of, uh, of their food. Uh, cotton has become uh, a, a bigger part, uh, timber and uh, lumber production. You know, all of those, uh, those things. So uh, agriculture, agribusiness is, uh, uh, is uh, the largest segment of our economy. And, and so when you think about North Carolina being in a state of transition, and you think about all the technological changes that, uh, that have taken place, you know, you wouldn't at first think about uh, agriculture still being uh, that big a segment of the economy, but it is. Uh, but uh, part of that is because a lot of those technological changes uh, have made their way to the farm. And a lot of those technological changes uh, have actually driven uh, some of the increases that we've seen uh, in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, knowledge, knowledge base, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, uh, those are, are things that, uh, that, that are a big part of the economy. And the pharmaceuticals industry probably, uh, if you went back 50 to 75 years, would have been a very, very minor part. Uh, of uh, the economy, and of course, uh, computers as they exist nowadays, uh, you know, didn't even ex didn't even exist 50 years ago. I mean, the thought that uh, that someone uh, would carry around in their pocket uh, a uh, a device that would enable them to uh, uh, to 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 send text uh, and voice uh, and pictures uh, and motion pictures to uh, any place in the world uh, was just unheard of. So those technological changes uh, have, uh, have changed a, a great deal uh, of how we live, uh, how we work, uh, and particularly uh, how, uh, how folks look at uh, their, their opportunities in the future. And a lot of that has, has, uh, uh, has worked its way uh, uh, into um, uh, every home uh, in the state. Uh, regardless, uh, in, in some respects, of uh, socioeconomic circumstances, uh, uh, that, that technological change is, uh, has affected us. And so one, one of the real challenges that we have um, as a state is, you know, what does that mean for us uh, in terms of uh, how should we structure our public education system? Uh, how should we um, uh, approach uh, the, uh, the infrastructure needs that we have? Where are we going to build our roads? Uh, do we need to uh, continue to expand our road system? Uh, we've um, we've gone from uh, from a, um, uh, a primary need uh, in terms of, uh, of of road infrastructure of uh, farm to market uh, to, uh, to to one that moves commerce uh, of of a different sort um, in the state uh, and from other states here and from here to other states. So it's uh, uh, significant, substantial changes that uh, that, that really impact uh, just every minute of somebody's life. It sounds like the, clearly technology is the underpinning of all of these disparate work environments, whether it's agribusiness or um, the knowledge industries. Um, it, it's a common denominator, there's no question about that. Do you think then that North Carolina is particularly well poised or has particular challenges with regard to sort of springing off of, of that base um, at a time when the economy is, is really looking for direction and looking for energy? Or, or not? I mean, the answer might no, be no. No, I, I think we are, and I think uh, part of uh, the reason we are has to do with uh, with a vision that uh, that that our predecessors uh, had, uh, both in the executive branch and uh, in the legislative branch. You know, research triangle is um, is is one of the real jewels uh, in in our country, but particularly in North Carolina, uh, that uh, gives us an edge uh, in um, uh, in that field. Our university system is uh, is something that uh, that, that has. Uh, provided us with uh, and and our, our children and our grandchildren with real opportunities to uh, to, to be you know re really in the center of, uh, of a lot of the changes and then the uh, the growth of the pharmaceutical industry in North Carolina has uh, has been something that's been a real driver and uh, and, and a real uh, uh, help for us uh, in in a lot of the changes that we're seeing well now another driver another component of North Carolina's economy obviously is the small business and and the entrepreneurs so let's let's turn our attention to them for just a moment they've traditionally been the backbone but uh, obviously this has been perhaps and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this a, a particularly difficult time for the small businessman in this last three years 
Do you think that the recession has altered that basic reality that small business is still the, the basis of our, our state's economy in many ways? Does it make it more or less true? Um, and then tell us a little bit about what you see down the road for the state's small business person um, and how the legislature might promote a better business climate, because you mentioned that in your opening comments, too. You know, I, I don't think that you can have a healthy economy unless you have a uh, significant component of, uh, of small business. And, and small business is, is anything from, uh, from a single person proprietorship uh, all the way up to uh, a business that employs several hundred, maybe even a thousand people. I mean, small business is a very broad uh, group of, uh, of business uh, entities. Uh, they have been, uh, continue to be, and uh, and will be in the future uh, the the key component and, and really a uh, uh, almost a, uh, a barometer of uh, the health of the economy as a whole. Because as the small businesses are doing well, then uh, I think the overall economy is doing well. As small businesses are struggling and having uh, challenges, I think the overall economy is uh, is having challenges. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the fact that small businesses employ more people uh, than uh, than anything else else uh, in our state and small businesses can include some of those farms those agribusinesses that are, that that are out there um, I, I think that at the present time uh, the challenges that uh, that we're facing are challenges that are particularly ones for small business simply because uh, when uh, when you um, the, the two things that we hear the most uh, from uh, from the business sector uh, that, uh, that that government um, has some involvement in is uh, regulation and taxation, uh, and uh, what we hear over and over again is that uh, that that, that overregulation and overtaxation uh, create create real impediments to the ability of small businesses uh, to, uh, to to be profitable, uh, the ability of small businesses uh, to uh, to be able to grow and expand. Uh, and uh, remember that uh, when a small business can be profitable, uh, when a small business can grow and expand, that means more jobs, that means more opportunity for other North Carolinians. So uh, what, uh, what I see at the present time is uh, a, a need uh, and really an effort at this point on the part of the, uh, the legislature to uh, try to address those, those two particular concerns to help small business, but uh, almost or, or uh, you know, as importantly uh, to, uh, to help the overall job picture in North Carolina. So uh, you know, presently in the legislature we've done a couple of things uh, dealing with, uh, with regulation that we think will be helpful. One uh, is we have, uh, we have a bill that uh, basically freezes uh, creates a moratorium on new regulation except uh, in certain uh, very narrowly defined uh, exceptions. Uh, and we've also uh, put together uh, House and Senate, a joint regulatory reform committee. Uh, and that committee is, uh, as we speak, going around the state, taking testimony in various places. They've already had uh, hearings in Wilmington and in Charlotte. They're going to be in the Greensboro area on Monday. And uh, the idea is that we want to hear from uh, small businesses and large businesses, uh, individuals, uh, people who are concerned about the environment. Uh, we want to hear what uh, North Carolina uh, thinks uh, about uh, the regulatory environment uh, that we have. And if the anecdotal information that we've uh, received over the years, uh, that uh, overregulation, uh, uh, permitting problems, those sorts of things are impediments, then we intend to move forward with legislation to, uh, to try to address that problem. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that we're concerned about uh, is the high level of taxation that, uh, that we've got, particularly the income tax, the individual income tax and the corporate income tax uh, in North Carolina. Uh, we think, uh, and uh, the business sector uh, indicates to us, that uh, high taxation uh, creates additional impediments to uh, the ability of uh, businesses to uh, grow and expand um, and to uh, add jobs uh, in North Carolina. One of the things that's uh, critical for us to do to try to address that is uh, the state budget is um, uh, woefully, uh, well, is way out of balance. And um, we are spending money at the state uh, level uh, far in excess of the revenue that's being uh, currently generated. And yet that revenue is being generated on, uh, on a tax uh, system that is the highest um, uh, tax system in the uh, southeast. We have higher uh, income taxes than, uh, than any of our peers in the southeast, some of the highest in the nation. So what we've got to do and what needs to be done is, is we've got to reduce the level of spending 
by state government to enable us to uh, to address the uh, high level of taxation. So at the present time, our uh, budget committees, uh, subcommittees are uh, going through the budget line item by line item and looking uh, at uh, various programs, looking at various uh, expenditure levels uh, and uh, trying to make decisions uh, so that we can get the state budget in balance uh, and at a lower level than, uh, than, it, uh, than it currently is. That will enable us to, uh, to, to address uh, our uh, tax rates. You know, the governor in her budget proposal uh, proposed uh, that we reduce the corporate tax in North Carolina uh, by two percentage points. Uh, we think that's a good idea. Uh, we also think we should uh, address the individual income tax uh, as well, but we can only do that uh, if we get our uh, spending uh, under control uh, and have the spending in line so that we can balance the budget uh, within the revenue that can be generated at lower tax rates. And uh, North Carolina, unlike the federal government, doesn't have the ability to uh, um, fire up the printing presses and just print more money. We've got to actually have the money uh, in order to uh, to cover the uh, the expenses that we uh, commit to. Okay, thank you. Well, now let's talk for a moment about um, the rural communities in North Carolina. Um, certainly, all of these issues and all these issues are, con are uh, concerns are shared both by rural and urban communities. They're not so separate and disparate in in their um, interests, but there are. Uh, studies that tell us the North Carolina Rural Center um, advises that almost a million rural North Carolinians are either out of work or living in poverty and that there's some thought that the loss of manufacturing jobs, the reduction of the number of farms and population loss have increased the impact of the recession then exponentially on this community of folks in North Carolina. Given those special challenges, or perhaps the challenges exacerbated by by the fact that they're rural, what would you see needs to happen in rural North Carolina to, to answer the challenges of, of this recession and beyond? Well, uh, part part of uh, answering that question is uh, is to just. Um uh, emphasize some of what uh, what you've uh, included in the question, and that is the changes that we've seen in in rural North Carolina. Um, we've uh, recently received uh, the the data from the the Census Bureau, and what we're seeing is, as part of uh, the North Carolina being in a state of transition, more and more of our citizens living in uh, in urban and suburban uh, communities, and fewer and fewer people living in uh, in in rural communities. On top of that, what we've seen is uh, historically North Carolina has had a fairly significant manufacturing presence, even in the rural areas, and we're seeing that um, uh, in many respects uh, not just change, but, uh, but but even go away. And then the third thing we're seeing is that uh, that even with the fact that uh, agriculture and agribusiness is uh, the largest business uh, uh, in North Carolina, uh, we've seen a loss of the cash crop. Uh, that uh, formerly existed, uh, particularly for those smaller farms uh, that uh, historically have uh, existed in North Carolina. So that, that presents a, uh, a group of challenges uh, for us because uh, if people are moving from the rural areas to the urban areas, uh, then there's a question about uh, what, what is there that uh, that can be done to make sure that our rural areas remain um, remain healthy from a from a uh, economic standpoint, and remain vibrant. Uh, and I think part of that um, uh, has to do with uh, with making sure that uh, that our public education system uh, continues to provide opportunities for uh, our, our kids in the rural areas. So a commitment to uh, to, to our K-12 education, uh, a commitment to um, uh, allowing parents to have uh, more uh, decision-making uh, power uh, in terms of, uh, of the, uh, the education of their children. Our community colleges uh, are, um, uh, are charged with, uh, with a great responsibility of, uh, of addressing some of the worker training and, uh, and other uh, basic education uh, needs that our adult populations or post-12th uh, uh, post uh, grade education uh, post 12th grade students have and so we we need to maintain a commitment to uh, to our community colleges uh, as well and then there's uh, there's a question of infrastructure the uh, the need for infrastructure in our rural areas uh, is uh, is becoming um, more and more of uh, uh, of a pressing need for us as we uh, uh, as we further examine some of the changes that we've seen 
And infrastructure these days means a whole variety of things that it didn't mean 50 years ago. Um, tell us where you'd like to, to focus the few resources we have if you have a particular thought about whether it would be um, infrastructure as it pertains to technology-based needs or infrastructure as it pertains to basic water and roads and, and the fundamentals of, of any society. Do you, do you have an area of, of priority or interest when you, when you look at that? Well, I think you've got to prioritize because if, uh, if you don't prioritize, particularly in, uh, in an era of, uh, of scarcity in terms of funds, uh, then, uh, then, then you don't spend enough on anything, uh, and so, uh, so I think uh, we we need to make sure that uh, that our traditional infrastructure is uh, is looked after, and that uh, that's that's our roads and bridges, uh, and uh, the addressing the issues of water uh, and sewer uh, availability. Uh, those uh, I think are are traditionally uh, functions that uh, that that government has uh, has a key uh, role in, and, and I actually uh, I, I think our uh, education system is part of that uh, rural infrastructure that we need to make sure that we uh, look after and uh, and we do everything that we can to protect. Uh, I think the the other thing that we need to uh, to, to continue to be uh, aware of and to uh, to to make sure that we don't lose sight of, uh, and that is that uh, that. Uh, we need to leave people uh, with the freedom uh, to uh, make uh, their own decisions uh, in, in terms of uh, how they want to live their lives and, and what they want to do. Uh, and so uh, it, it, this applies whether it's our urban areas or our rural areas. Um, uh, sometimes uh, the government can try to do too much, and sometimes the government can get too involved in people's lives, uh, and we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, and we need to uh, try to uh, continue to foster, uh, in some respects, to renew uh, a, an emphasis on individual responsibility and uh, uh, certainly the traditional work ethic that uh, that we've had had in North Carolina. Okay. Um, you mentioned, have mentioned several times, obviously, the importance of education, not just K-12, but also the university system and the community college system. Tell, expand on that a little bit more, if you will, for us. Um, what you'd like to see in, in each of those sectors, um, it, it, I think that there might also be a, a concurrence, at least, that there need to be some changes, some updates, some um, I won't use the, the reform word, the R word, but uh, tell us more about what you'd like to see in helping education um, support both urban and rural communities. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm often uh, uh, in conversations with people and uh, one of the things that, that I hear a lot is, uh, you know, government needs to be run like a business, uh, you know, and uh, I, I, I don't necessarily uh, agree wholeheartedly with that statement. I, I think we need to, uh, to look at applying business principles to a lot of things in government, and, and I think education is one of those areas that uh, that, w that we need to think about uh, some business principles and uh, and think about applying those principles. We also need to uh, to, to look at some basic uh, understandings that, uh, that that really have uh, have existed for a long time in education that we may have lost sight of. Uh, and, and also to uh, to take a look at some of the things that that have been done over the last several years that uh, probably have been um, uh, very well have been very expensive but have not necessarily uh, provided what we need in education. So in in, in terms of uh, those sorts of things, uh, we need to look uh, at um, uh, the, uh, the the issue of uh, how do we improve overall performance uh, in public education, whether it's in a rural area or, uh, or in the urban area. And the one thing that, uh, that we, uh, we all know is the, uh, the best thing that can be done to improve student performance is to make sure that there is a highly qualified, motivated teacher uh, in front of the classroom of students. Uh, it is uh, by far the best predictor of student uh, outcomes uh, that we have. Uh, have a good teacher, uh, in front of, uh, of students, you're going to get uh, better outcomes than if you have uh, a less qualified teacher in front of those, uh, those same students. So uh, what do we need to do or, or what are the things that, uh, that, that will uh, make sure that we have uh, the best teachers? Well, one of the things we need to have, uh, and this is where we're talking about applying business principles, we need to have an effective way to evaluate uh, teacher performance. 
Uh, and it needs to be more than uh, than just looking at test scores and uh, and seeing uh, that, uh, that 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 kids scored a, a certain amount. But test scores, while they shouldn't be the only criteria, need to be part of the mix. Uh, we need to have evaluations uh, by peers. Uh, we need to have evaluations uh, by uh, by supervisors, by principals and superintendents, or or at least uh, central office people. We need to have evaluations, uh, in my view, uh, by parents. Uh, and in some instances, we need to get feedback from students. Uh, that way we can, uh, can have uh, a, um, uh, an idea of who the best teachers are. Uh, you know, um, uh, it, it's really not all that complicated because uh, you, can, uh, you can go into just about any elementary school in this state uh, and, uh, and talk to a group of second grade uh, parents uh, whose kids are about to go into the third grade. And they can, to a person, tell you who the good third grade teachers are and who the teachers are that they would like uh, to make sure that their, their kids probably don't end up in, in the classroom with. But we don't use those kinds of, um, uh, of evaluation techniques to make a decision about who the good teachers are. Now, once we've, uh, once we've decided who the better teachers are, then we need to have a uh, system where we pay those good teachers more because we want to keep them in the classroom and, and we want them in front of uh, in front of the students so that's that's one of the goals that I would have uh, in in education is to uh, to move forward with uh, identifying uh, the best teachers uh, and making sure that we have those best teachers uh, in in classrooms another thing that uh, that we uh, we need to do is uh, is we know um, and, and we've known for thousand years that uh, when someone knows how to read, uh, they have an ability uh, to, uh, to, to learn. Uh, you know, the old, uh, the, the old tenet is uh, learn to read, read to learn. You know, once, once, you've, once you've mastered uh, the art of reading, uh, then, uh, then, then you can um, uh, pretty much, with, uh, with appropriate guidance, uh, you, the, the world is open to you. Uh, but if you don't know how to read, uh, then, uh, then, then the world is a very, very difficult place. Uh, if our kids don't know how to read by the time they get out of the third grade, uh, we are in just deep trouble in terms of, uh, of the outcomes that we're going to have from, uh, from that student population. So one of the things I would like to see us do is, uh, is emphasize reading uh, in uh, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. And I don't think we should promote a student from the third grade to the fourth grade if that student cannot pass a basic reading examination. Uh, but we, we shouldn't just hold those kids back. Uh, we've got to provide them with additional help uh, to make sure that we've given them uh, the tools that they need so that uh, they can, uh, as they go forward uh, in school, read to learn. And, uh, and, and so that's an emphasis that I think we need to, uh, to have. It's not something new. It's not something that's uh, recently discovered by some scientific survey. It's pretty basic stuff. And, uh, and I think we've lost focus on that. And, uh, and so, uh, so, so I think it would be helpful if, uh, if we uh, tried to return to, uh, to that sort of focus. The other thing that we do is, uh, is, is we have a uh, educational system that, uh, that, that seems to be geared uh, to um, once you uh, enter kindergarten, uh, we're going to prepare you, or uh, I'm not sure we're going to prepare you, uh, we expect everybody to go on to college. Well, everybody's not going to go to college, and uh, everybody, uh, uh, first of all, doesn't want to go to college, and uh, not everybody has the aptitude for college. Um, we need to, uh, to recognize that there are opportunities, career opportunities for folks uh, that, uh, that don't necessarily involve uh, going off to Chapel Hill, don't necessarily involve going off to, uh, to NC State or, or any other of our you know, fine public uh, institutions. Um, and I don't think we do that at this time. I think we, uh, we, we try to push everybody into uh, the, the same uh, cubbyhole. And, uh, and so I think that's a real disservice uh, to a number of our kids. And I think it contributes to our high dropout rates. Well, 
We've talked for a few minutes about one end of the constituency spectrum, our youngest citizens. And now we're going to look at the other end of the, of the chronological spectrum. Um, because both the nation and North Carolina are about to experience this sudden, dramatic, indeed historic growth in the number of people who are age 65 and older. So even though we know, and you mentioned this at the, the beginning of our discussion too, that so many of those folks, 65 and above, are going to stay in the workplace longer than they might have um, 30 to 40 years ago, what kind of challenges does this phenomenon of, of a, a large older population bring to the state's economy? And then let's look at what kind of opportunities it might present as well. We'll, we'll look at the, both sides of that sword. Sure, and I, and I think some of the challenges uh, actually are some of the opportunities uh, that, that exist. You know, one of the challenges is that with an aging population, it, uh, it puts uh, additional demands on the uh, need for health care. Uh, well, wh what that does is that creates a real opportunity as far as employment, uh, creates an opportunity uh, in terms of, uh, of infrastructure. Uh, so with, uh, with an aging population, uh, we need to have facilities available uh, for health care. We need to have uh, people trained uh, and available to provide uh, those health care services. Uh, it also creates uh, an opportunity in terms of some of the recreational or some of the, uh, the lifestyle choices that, uh, that an aging population uh, would would, uh, would look towards and you know we've seen that in North Carolina for a long time you know we're, we're a, a golf course destination for a lot of people and uh, and I think we do have um, a, an opportunity in North Carolina uh, to entice and attract more retirees but you know that brings me back to one of the other things that I spoke about earlier uh, if you have someone who is uh, about to retire and they're trying to decide whether they want to move to North Carolina or they want to move to Florida or they want to move to Texas or some other uh, place where it's a little warmer than it is in Michigan or New York or Pennsylvania or you know one of the northern climates, uh, one of the things that they're going to look at is uh, what is the uh, relative tax rate uh, for my, uh, my investment income, for my retirement income. Uh, and we don't stack up very well against uh, some of those other Sunbelt states uh, in that regard. So I, I think we uh, uh, attract fewer and fewer of, uh, of those folks than, uh, than we otherwise could. Uh, so uh, one of the opportunities that we have with, uh, with the overall aging of our population uh, is an opportunity to create uh, new industries uh, in North Carolina, particularly in, uh, uh, in connection with, as I mentioned, health care, in connection with, um, uh, with some of the service sector um, uh, industries. And, uh, and I think that's uh, something that uh, we're uh, not taking full advantage of uh, up to this point. Well, Senator, thank you so much for, for offering your time to, to the citizens of the state to, to share with them your thoughts on some of these issues. Before we, we close this particular discussion, did you have any other thoughts about uh, the impact that uh, this recession has had on its citizens and, and uh, any, any thoughts as you move forward with your work uh, across the street in the legislature? Well, I think the, the only thing I would say is uh, I, I think the, uh, the recession has uh, created uh, a real opportunity for us to, uh, to take a look at what what we, uh, what we expect uh, state government to do and take a look at uh, what is the, uh, the appropriate size of state government. And I've used the term that, uh, that, that uh, we, we need to treat this as a chance to really right size uh, our state government. And uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's, it's time that that was done and uh, the, the economic challenges that we face uh, are giving us the, uh, the chance to, to do that. Uh, I think um, by uh, making the right decisions now, what we will do is we will put North Carolina in a place where uh, when uh, the economy begins to pick up, and it will, uh, it will pick up, uh, that, uh, that, that we are poised uh, to, to, to really see uh, our small business sector, our agribusiness sector, uh, and, uh, and, and other parts of our economy really take off and, uh, and provide uh, those jobs that people want and uh, provide those opportunities that our young people need. Okay. Thank you so sure, much. We you. appreciate your time.